I just want to let you know that um, your microphones will be on mute while we are on our webinar today. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the chat box and we will address them either during the webinar or at the end during the question and answer session. Um, if you'd like to verbally ask a question, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute your microphone. And this meeting is being recorded. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, we are here today to understand how to implement an SEL program with efficacy by engaging the community. And our outcomes are to understand why the implementation process of district-wide SEL goes beyond programming. We will also identify a roadmap to district-wide implementation of an SEL program. Today we have with us Dr. Joe Ricca, And Dr. Joe Ricca is the superintendent of White Plains Public School in New York. Dr. Ricca, would you like to uh, give us a little bit of your background? Sure, good morning everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to meet you, uh, with you uh, virtually. Thanks so much for, for the invitation. Um, again, Joe Ricca, superintendent of schools, White Plains City School District uh, here in Westchester County, New York. Uh, school district is a uh, just about 7,200 children, nine buildings, and about a $230 million budget. Um, and my Reader's Digest background really is, um, I was a social studies teacher and uh, of course assistant principal, principal, and I'm uh, working on my 11th year as superintendent of schools. Uh, social emotional learning is near and dear to my heart. Character education was um, one of my, uh, my dissertation topic and uh, one of the, the foundational aspects of uh, high quality public education. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. We're going to get into, I think um, most people who are on this webinar are pretty familiar with social emotional learning, but just to make sure that we all have the same context, what we're talking about is helping individuals understand and regulate their emotions, successfully complete goals, take others' perspectives or point of view, develop positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. Um, I think we've seen a real change in um, schools and our role with children over the years. I know that when I was teaching many years ago, this was obviously very important, but I think it has become more and more important as, um, as we go on. So why, why is this important? Well, obviously students come to us with all different kinds of backgrounds and situations. Um, but really it's about making sure that they are ready to learn and social emotional learning really prepares our students um, and gives them a higher capacity to learn. If you could look at this slide here, it says basically that social emotional skills, positive attitudes, pro-social behaviors and academic achievement all go up significantly when there is a program and practices in place and um, conduct problems, emotional distress and drug use actually go down. So that in and of itself is a very strong argument. I'm not gonna go through this whole um, competency model here, but if you look at the CASEL competencies, we look at social emotional learning as kind of made up of all of these different aspects of self-management, decision-making, relationship skills, social awareness, self-awareness, and all of the things that are um, kind of involved in making sure that we can um, execute on the strategy in a, in a positive way. What we are going to be focusing on today is really that outer ring, the homes and communities, and especially building awareness and kind of buy-in in your community. So Dr. Rico, one of the reasons that we asked you to join us today is because um, you have implemented some of the social emotional learning in your district and really um, have engaged your community. 
So I'd like to ask you, what, what were some of the initial steps you, look, you took when deciding to implement an SEL program? Yeah, um, sure. So I think, you know, the first thing I have to do is, is give a big shout out to, to all the faculty and staff members here in the district, as well as our community members, because, you know, you really can't start having this conversation in earnest unless the folks within the community, both the educational community and the general community, want to have that conversation. Um, so initially, the conversation really focused on, you know, why, right? Why would we focus on social emotional learning? Um, while at the same time, you know, sort of making sure that we're attending to all these the academic and extracurricular and arts and so on and so forth. And what we did, uh, you know, as a team is, is identify that the social emotional learning component is probably the most important foundational component of a high quality school district or a high quality learning environment. So initially we identified um, ways that we could as, as teachers, as administrators and as community members contribute to a, to a positive um, social and emotional learning environment for all of our kids. Uh, we wanted to look at how we were faring with regard to student engagement. We wanted to look at how we were faring with regard to retention, um, to graduation, um, student uh, self-satisfaction, all of those different sort of indicators that would identify a strong social emotional or, or a positive uh, climate and culture in our classrooms and in our buildings. Those were some of the you know, very initial steps that we, we started to look at. Sure. When, when uh, you started this process, you said you have kind of a formula that's built around those key issues. What does, what does that look like? Sure. You know, I think, I think what we have to do you know, first is, is learn from our community, right? Learn from our stakeholders, gather information. How are we doing, uh, you know, social emotional learning in such a large umbrella uh, you know, we all did it to each other this morning when we came into this, this group, you know, everyone's saying good morning, right? It's so simple. You can start right there. Um, so we, we wanted to take stock of how we were doing, you know, without really focusing a tremendous amount of attention. Um, so we gathered that data. We also made sure that we, we were giving ownership to, to the educational community to help guide the conversation. So, you know, in terms of thinking about strategic planning or how we we're going to take next steps, we made sure that folks in the educational community had the say and really and really were guiding um, that that vision and that mission. We also wanted to make sure that we were really focusing on on sort of branding the district with uh, um, social emotional learning in mind. Right um, when when we think about school districts, typically you think about test scores, you think about um, graduation rates, you think about AP classes and SAT scores, and how did you do on the NAEP? All of those things are very important. Don't get me wrong. But when moms and dads are thinking about their schools, the first thing they're thinking about is, is my child happy? Is my child safe? Is my child secure? These are all really important factors in a high quality school environment. And you notice that you, you pointed to some of the data earlier that those high quality, those high level academic achievement indicators are, mm -hmm. going to, are going to come with focus and attention on strong climates and cultures. And then, of course, what we did was we, we made sure that we were celebrating our successes. And we continue to do that. I mean, anybody who takes a look at my Twitter feed, uh, you know, I have to be and I love to be the biggest cheerleader of our schools and our community because, number one, they deserve it. But also because they really should see that their hard work is paying off each and every day. Absolutely. Thank you. So when we let's let's go back to learning from your stakeholders. What types of organizations did you look at when you decided to get the community involved in the first place? Right, so we had to make sure that, first of all, we were kind of sharing what we were looking for and what we were trying to figure out with everyone and, and that they could understand what the benefit um, from, from focusing on social emotional learning would be. So, you know, a lot of times people are, are, are talking about um, soft skills and that, and that sort of, curls my hair a little bit because really, you know, soft skills to me are, are essential skills, right? And, and so often they're kind of like secondary or maybe even tertiary to what we think about in, in schools and um, really they should be primary. So when you're thinking about, you know, self-awareness, self-reflection, communication and relationships, um, engagement and community, those are not soft skills at all. Those are essential skills. And by the way, you know, the, the best um, performing whole whole child example of, of education or students who possess those essential essential skills 
um, and, and utilize them tremendously. So, you know, learning from our stakeholders, we, we first needed to make sure that we explained to them what it was we were trying to learn about. We, we wanted to go to um, different, different parts of the community to, to get a sense of what their experience had been and has been. Um, and, you know, we learned a lot. We learned a lot about the importance of making sure that each and every child feels like they have a critical um, partner in, in their school, so a trusted adult that they could go to. We learned a lot about making sure that we were focusing um, on all children, right? And, and, of course, you know that intuitively, but it's important to hear that from, from stakeholders. And, you know, one of the things that we, we thought we would do, and which is important and, and we continue to do to this day and will continue to in the future, is com put committees together. Um, that are actually identifying challenges and making sure that we're focusing our resources and focusing our attention in those areas to, to strengthen um, the district's practices. Yeah, I know that's one of the things that is actually happening in the district where my son attends as well. There's a, a community group made of parents and other stakeholders that are meeting regularly with um, those at the school that are that are kind of heading up this effort in our district. So right. I, I appreciate that very much as a parent. And you need that, right? You need, you need a cross section. First of all, you need to make sure students are involved. And, and I, I'm sure some of our um, listeners today are, are shaking their heads, right? Because I mean, I, I've seen, and maybe I've even been guilty of it. Oftentimes you'll, you'll look at all the adult stakeholders and, you, and it's almost like a second thought, but it should be the first thought. Make sure the students' voices are part of that. Right. Um, you know, teachers, support staff, and, and don't forget custodians, bus drivers, folks who work in the cafeterias, um, your community partners, faith-based organizations, your, your local uh, mental health folks, uh, primary care providers, retirees, elected officials. Uh, you know, there are so many community partners that you really need to have um, as part of this conversation. So, you know, we, we started really simple, right? You know, communication campaign where let's sit down and have coffee. Um, and we and we still do that, and and we see that the, the, oftentimes from those conversations, you, you really get great ideas on how you can build out um, and, and improve your practice. You know, one of the things um, that we discussed previously too was even engaging some other folks, like that you wouldn't think of necessarily, um, perhaps senior citizen groups and um, maybe community organizations, charity organizations. Um, service organizations, because when you think about um, where our children are going after they leave the school, uh, they are going out into the community as workers and as um, community members and action leaders and volunteers and and in, into all of these places. So it's it's kind of taking the approach of engaging everyone in all of the different groups in the community so that they understand what's going on in the schools and how to engage with those students as well. That's a really great point. Um, you know, the seniors in the community are, are an excellent um, stakeholder group to gain a sense of what their perspective is on the school system. Um, making sure that you, you're forming partnerships if you don't already have them with your local community colleges or area colleges or universities. And even corporate um, partners are, are oftentimes willing to support this type of work because you're absolutely right. Look, you know, when folks are investing in young people um, at an early age to ensure that they have these, th these types of skills as they're acquiring their academic skills, it's good for everybody. And employers see that and so do colleges. Absolutely. So in your experience, when you roll this out in your district, um, were the community, was the community already on board or was there a lot of convincing that you had to do? So that's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, um, participants and, and people who you're going to have conversations with are coming at this from really different angles. One of the things that I've learned over time uh, is dependent upon when you went to school, that could really have a dramatic impact on what your perspective is about this work. I mean, no one's going to come out, right, and, and deny the importance of, of strong social and emotional learning opportunities. No one's going to come out and say, hey, you know, you shouldn't be focusing on self-awareness and self-reflection. But at the same time, depend, again, dependent upon what your experiences were, some folks see this sort of as like a secondary thing, right? It's, it's the warm and fluffy or fuzzy 
um, you know, sort of component. And this really doesn't have anything to do with academics. You really should be focusing on, you know, increasing the number of AP courses you have or increasing the number of enrichment opportunities, all of which, of course, are important. But at the same time, what we have to make sure that we're doing is communicating, no, 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 this is the foundation, right? This work is what's going to help to elevate and provide for more access and more opportunity for all students. And you know, what I've found when, when engaging community members, if, if we kind of come at it from that, um, that angle, um, people really begin to sort of think about it in a different way. Remember, it's hard to kind of, if you're not in education, um, it's, it's hard to kind of remove yourself from what you experience. And most of us, when we were in school 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, this really wasn't at a high, like you mentioned earlier, really wasn't at a high level of understanding, at least by a need, right? We all love, you know, we had that teacher we loved. And, you know, when you really think hard, why did you love him or her? Well, because it was a really positive social emotional climate in that classroom, generally speaking, right? right? It was a warm place to be. You enjoyed it. You were happy. You felt like you, you, you were connected. Um, so we have to we have to get folks to to really understand what this is and the gravity of it and how important it is when we're talking about student development and academic achievement. You know, one of the other things that I think about, especially you know, graduating in in the '80s, was that we didn't have social media back then, and oh, sure. it has been such a huge influence on our society and the ways that you know, in many ways, can bring us together, but in many ways can polarize us and the um, just the rise of cyber bullying and bullying in general and shaming people has been such a a weird thing to watch <laughs> yeah. know, as far as I'm concerned and a lot of you know people who are not engaged on those platforms or don't see it for themselves I think you know a lot of people are on those platforms but there's still a a big contingent out there that are not or who don't engage very much or you know just don't understand the climate that's going on I think a lot of times it's simply about educating people about what is happening that they may or may not be aware of it's, it's such a great point now you know my, I graduated I graduated high school in 1996 and you know from, from even that point to, to today the world is completely different in terms of communication and connection. I will tell you that you know the hope is, um, and I think the bright side is that in many instances, our young people are be better digital citizens than our adults. Um, you know, when we're talking about when we're talking about using social media platforms and using them appropriately, and being mindful of others and respectful and responsible, um, we're teaching that in school, right? And I know moms and dads and, and guardians and caregivers at home are teaching that as well. Um, so I think, you know, in, ter in terms of the, the benefits here of, of that holistic approach, you can't deny it. Now, bullying and, and harassment in schools is an age old problem. Um, you know, many folks who are probably listening right now either knew of someone who was bullied or maybe um, even themselves was a target at one point in time. I think we're doing a good job of calling that out and elevating a level of conversation related to those behaviors. And social emotional learning has a lot to do with that. We're finally saying that this is not okay. Um, we're finally saying that this is not boys being boys or girls being girls or turn the other cheek or sticks and stones will break my bones, you know, but names won't hurt me. We know names hurt and we know names actually end up um, hurting students down the road and, and even, even into adulthood. So, you know, these, these types of approaches in our classrooms are making a huge difference in the healthy development of human beings. Again, when we think about kids, we like think about, you know, elementary school kids. These are little human beings. These are little, you know, citizens. These are little, um, you, you know, future policymakers, right, and leaders and, and inventors. And, and we have to treat them, um, you know, with that, that, that care so that they can grow up healthy and, and well-adjusted. And, and these types of approaches, uh, you know, focusing on the social and emotional is, is doing just that. It's also a really great entry point for difficult conversations. And by the way, when I say difficult conversations, they shouldn't be difficult, but they, because of the way our social construct is, they are. So when we're talking about equity, and what does that mean, right? When we're talking about access to education, high quality education for all, and what does that mean? And, you know, that, those are big, deep, sometimes challenging conversations that we need to be engaging in in our schools 
because what we're seeing right now across the country is we're actually seeing while, while academic achievement is on the rise and while graduation rates are on the rise and while you know children probably know no more right because there's so much more information and access to it um, that we're actually seeing a resegregation of schools and we're actually seeing concern that students with special needs uh, might not have as much access as they once had um, and attention being turned away from from students um, you know who have varying needs in our in our schools and that that cannot happen you know we we have to make sure that we're having these conversations and improving equitable practices and not and not reducing them absolutely um, I want to go back to something that you said when we were talking about starting to engage the community and you said that you should rebrand with SEL in mind. What do you mean by that? Sure. So, you know, a lot of times when we talk about schools, we don't like to, to, to use um, <laughs> terms that are used in business. Um, but, 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 you know, for lack of a better word, and there probably is a better word, so forgive me, um, you know, but, but when I think of you know, our, your school district or, or, or your school, or even your classroom, right, they, they have a brand, you know, what does it mean to be part of, of your school district or your school community? Um, I think, you know, what we need to do is, or at least what we did, is we really began to highlight um, not just academics, not just athletics, not just the arts, but also the social emotional learning opportunities that were taking place. When kids were volunteering, when they were working together to problem solve, when they were forming groups, when they were speaking out against issues in, in the public square that they disagreed with. We started to highlight those things and celebrate them. Uh, and, and what we found, again, you know, from talking with our community, um, is that our community didn't know some of these really amazing things that our children were engaged with. And, and when they learned, you know, the approaches that our kids were taking, you know, we had students, high school students, organizing countywide um, marches, uh, you know, or organizing um, uh, different types of rallies, um, getting together at soup kitchens, you, you know, making sure that they were volunteering in the community for beautification. These are the types of initiatives and these are the types of activities that if you, if you focus your school district um, communications on or, or at least integrate them, um, you, we found that, that our community was really so pleased with, with what was happening. Also working with our community partners and, you know, like our PTA and, and, and the city in general, um, making sure that, that we're highlighting those positive partnerships. That, you know, there, 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 is, there are no partitions, um, that there are no fiefdoms, everybody's working together uh, to, to really try to move our children forward. This we found was, was amazing. Um, you know, we, this year we're using a, the hashtag WP proud and it's everywhere. <laughs> I mean, everywhere. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we're, we're doing things like interviewing um, students who had graduated and finding out how they did in college and what they're doing now and how the school district supported them and or areas that we could have improved on. Um, we're doing things like just talking to kids in school. Um, what's your experience like running focus groups and then sharing information um, that we can with our community, both good, but, but also areas that we're improving on. So, you know, when, when we thought of our brand, and really our brand here in, in the district is, um, you know, real life learning. And kids are getting experiences um, here that they're going to be able to translate into positive experiences and success when they graduate. So, um, as the executive director of outreach for Michigan Virtual Branding is kind of my thing. I love yeah. it. <laughs> so, when I when I think about that, when when people ask me what a brand is, I always say um, it's what people say about you. Mm. It's it's what people think about your company or your school or you as a person. Right. Right. in personal branding. So it's really important that when you're thinking about the, the brand of your school, what do you want people to say about you? And, right. and I think the first, um, the first step in that communication plan is really to think about what do you want them to say and who are you going to say it to? So once, once you do that, um, what was the what were the steps that you took to communicate that message to your audiences? Yeah, it, it's a great question. You know, one of the things that I noticed as again a superintendent in a in a fairly large school district for our area um, is when visiting when visiting our schools, 
I, no I, I noticed the children smiling all the time, right? And, you know, as a, as a teacher, and uh, as a parent, and particularly a superintendent, you love to see that, right? So I, I thought to myself, gosh, you know, we need to start sharing these just picture everyday pictures of kids engaged in activities and enjoying themselves in our schools. And what we began to do was really leverage every possible technology that we could to get those types of pictures and images and, and short video clips out almost on a daily basis. And you know, the feedback was extraordinarily positive. Um, parents and guardians and community members were just thrilled to see not just the activities and the academic engagement that was going on in the buildings, but also that their children were happy and that they were enjoying their time in school and time with their teachers and time with their classmates. Now, this is very, these are very powerful images. It's one thing to send, you know, sort of like the digital end of the week newsletter with a couple of articles, and that's great, and, and you should still definitely do that. Um, but we really found that showing people, uh, you know, either through multimedia or, or even just pictures, you know, uh, had a really profound effect and, and really raised the level of pride in things that were taking place. We did that. We also started to leverage things like Facebook Live for short interviews with people in the district. Um, we also started to put together, you know, short videos about the district. We reshaped our, our website, which is again, you know, going through another sort of iteration of reshaping to make it more user friendly. Uh, and, and all throughout that process, focusing both on, on the, academic, the high level academic achievement and as well as the, the many, many social and emotional learning opportunities and supports that were throughout the district. And this messaging, I think, is really important. You know, you have to have a clear vision and mission for, for what you're working toward in your school, in your classroom, or even, you know, in your school district. Constantly communicating that message and showing folks how you're making progress toward that mission and that vision regularly is really, really important. And that's something that we work on every day. And I have to say, you know, it can be done at the classroom level and done so well. I just give a shout out to my my son's kindergarten teacher, they utilize a platform and they're always sending updates and pictures. And you know, as a teacher, you have so much to do and so much on your plate. And I know that it's, it's really like a balance of, of, well, I have to get all these you know, administrative or ministerial tasks done. But these types, of, these types of quick updates and activities really boost the engagement and, and sort of the collective support for, for your classroom or your school. So you know, we, we're really finding success with it. And, um, there's just so much good happening. You have to share it. Well, and, and I think with everything else, when you, when you have a goal in mind, the intentionality behind it is half the battle, right? So right. When, when you know what you're doing and you're, you're, you know the reasons that you're doing it, that it really helps kind of solidify that in the minds of both the people who are communicating and, and then hopefully in those that you're communicating to. Exactly. So... I think about the um, SEL programs and there, there are some people who have programs or other people who just kind of embody the principles of, of SEL and talk about that with their staff and making sure that that's um, you know, happening in the classrooms. But when you think about engaging your community for SEL, does that require a lot of resources? I mean, how much, how much money did you have to set aside or do you set aside or what does that look like in your district? Yeah, that, that, and that's a great question. And I, and I should say, you know, one of the best things about social and emotional learning approaches is many of them are, are they cost nothing, uh, you know, outside of perhaps maybe getting together in soft costs of professional development or um, community conversations, you know, a pot of coffee um, and, 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 and really sort of, you know, redeploying some of the resources that you already have at, at your disposal. So that's the good thing. I mean, there, there definitely are programs, you know, uh, that you could go out and, and engage with um, and implement within your district that, that focus on social emotional learning. But if you don't have resources at hand, which many folks that, that are in public schools, you know, that's, that's always a, a challenge. Um, I think looking sort of around and, and first, you know, seeing what can you do in your sphere of influence um, to really engage with this work uh, and move it forward without a substantial investment of, of perhaps funds that, that are not presently available. And, and I'll, I'll go back to sort of the, the, uh, the castle um, 
uh, framework because in, in full disclosure, I, I don't work for them, but we are, we, the district are working with them uh, to do a social emotional learning audit uh, in our district this year. So, you know, when you look at the tenets of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationships, and responsible decision-making, mm-hmm. I think, I think for many teachers and for many principals and folks who work with children every day, these are already in, integrated into what you're doing. Sure. I, think, I think the importance is calling them out and identifying them for, for what they are and identifying them for as goals within a lesson or within an activity or even within a community sort of you know, initiative. I think that's what's important, that you're, you're raising the awareness that, hey, we're not just working on um, you know, recycling but we're also making sure we're working on social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making at the same time. And then you can, and and then you can, you know, again, really bring and move that forward in in almost everything you're doing. So, you know, I I think uh, that, that resources are always scarce. Uh, It it doesn't, it doesn't need to cost you a lot of money. Um, And, you know, I always say smiles cost nothing, right? Kindness, care, and compassion cost nothing. This morning, we all said good morning to each other. Uh, if you start every day with, with saying good morning to children, smiling and being truly happy to see them, you already are on your way to having a great day um, with regard to their, their emotional uh, learning aspects. You know, I think you brought up a good point is, is that um, some of these skills, obviously we're already doing them as educators and we're already trying to model the practice or Um, you know, when we set up our rules at the beginning of the year, we talk about treating each other with respect and what that looks like and all of those sorts of activities that we are already doing. I think when you kind of call it out and name it, um, that helps students understand that it's kind of a bigger concept and that different situations can be applied to that concept. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should, I, I, I don't want to cut you in, but I, I should mention, we, we also have to model it. Um, you know, that's really important as well uh, as, as the folks who are working with kids. And, and, and what you find as, as you get deeper into the work is if you sort of make a mistake or stray a little bit or you're having a bad day, um, when you know you're in a good place is when students actually, you know, look to the adults and say, hey, is everything okay? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's, what, what's happening? You, you're seeing, you know, this actualization of, of, of a realization that they are part of a community. Um, you know, everybody has a bad day, right? Uh, and, and when folks are all looking out for each other, children, adults alike, um, you know, you really know you're moving in the right direction. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, so we talked about engaging, wait, where am I? Got to get in the right screen here, sorry about that. So you talked a little bit earlier about equity Um, and making sure that there's equity and we're thinking about all children when we're talking about SEL. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, You know, and I I know everybody everybody knows this, but I always like to make sure that that it's stated at the outset. I I believe that um, folks who are involved in in education um, are all folks who are there for the right reasons. They want to see children succeed. Nobody gets in their car and drives to school and says, you know, I'm really looking forward to handing out F's today, right? At least I hope not. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not, right. Uh, and, and, you know, teachers are, are they, they're probably some of the hardest workers uh, in, in the world. And I, I personally think they're, they're the most important profession in, in, in the world because if they don't do what they do, uh, you know, nobody else does what they do later. That said, um, we have a problem with equity. Uh, we, we've always had a problem and we, uh, I don't mean, you know, I mean, we as people, right? Right. Um, we oftentimes confuse equity with equality. And, and that's really, that, that's really um, a dangerous thing because equality doesn't give individuals what they need to succeed. We need to be focusing on our children individually and collectively, but recognizing that the individual child, every single one of them is different. And every single one of them is going to have a particular need, um, you know. And we need to be working toward addressing all of their needs in in a manner, uh, you know, that that is equitable, which is it can be challenging because 
you know, that means that some people are saying, well, wait a second, doesn't that mean that one child might receive a different type of support or service or experience than another child? And the answer is yes, um, right? I mean, you, you kind of have to come to the realization that standardization is very difficult to do with human beings. And it may even be <laughs> negative, right? I mean, to think that everybody could be standardized and the same is sort of anathema to the individuality of, of, of people. So, you know, the, the idea that we as educators um, are, are reaching toward equity is a really important one. And again, you have to go back to your zone of influence. What can you do as a professional that's providing equitable access for your kids. So if you're a principal, what are you doing in your building? If you're a classroom teacher, what are you doing in your classroom? If you work on the playground, how are you making sure that the playground experience for children is equitable? And it's a, listen, it's a heavy lift, right? Because there are a lot of things that need to um, be attended to. I, I think that when we're talking about social emotional learning, it makes it, it's, it's sort of a natural segue to take a look at our practices and our organizations and identify if, if we do have barriers for students to succeed. So now I'll give you some, you know, just common examples. Um, do we have certain types of programs that only certain types of kids get into or can be in? Um, if the answer is yes, is that depriving other children of, of an experience that might be beneficial to them, right? That's a hypothetical, but I think if we all think about those types of situations, you know, does that create inequity? And what does that do to this classroom community? What does it do to this school community? Um, when, when we're providing access for all children, you're going to see a reduction in all types of, of challenging situations, like for instance, um, you know, disengagement in the classroom um, or disciplinary issues. I mean, we, we know that. Uh, we also know um, that sometimes those very, very same types of situations are, are applied uh, disproportionately to some types of kids, right? When you, when you think about discipline in your class as a teacher, do some children get in trouble, in trouble with quotes, right, faster than other children? And if that's the case, why? And, and those are the types of questions I think that you have to ask yourself as a, as a professional um, you know, and then you know, as you move forward, you can start applying them to the larger organization. But again, social emotional learning is a perfect outlet for this because these are the types of conversations you can have with kids. What's their experience, right? Um, and, and then integrate that into your own learning. I, I imagine, uh, you know, one of the biggest topics, of course, in education is personalization and kind of applying this concept to subject areas. But this is really the probably the easiest entry point to personalization um, that there is because it's based on an individual relationship. I, I think you're right. And you know, and I, and I think, I think it really, again, raises sort of that level of consciousness. And I, I think of classroom libraries, for instance, right? The books that children have access to in, in a classroom library. Does, would every child be able to find a book in your classroom that he or she could relate to? And, if they could relate to it, is it going to make them feel good, or is it going to bring you know get you know get them into a place where uh, they're not feeling so great about themselves? So I'll get I'll give an example. Many times, what we see is when children of uh, you know Native American children, children of Native American ancestry, read books that have Native Americans in them. They're often historical pieces, right? Sure. It's it, you know what I mean. Because and, and and by the way, it's not because the classroom teacher didn't think to find books that would, that would help, you know, to connect uh, in, in contemporary times. It's just because that's the way, you know, those, those books were arranged in that class, or maybe you inherited that class or library, whatever the case may be. But these are the types of things that you would look at from a social emotional lens to determine whether or not there are, there are equity issues or there are barriers that might be in place in your class. It's powerful stuff. It's tough stuff. Um, but if everyone's making an effort toward doing that, um, I think we're moving our schools in a better in a better way, and I think we're giving our children more access. Great. So um, earlier in our conversation, you talked about the necessity of celebrating your successes. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit more? 
Absolutely. Well, and I, and I don't know if everybody would agree with me on this, and maybe maybe some won't. But I think when most people come at education, we're we're looking at it from again that deficit mindset, that deficit lens. What isn't happening that should be happening? Oh, test scores are too low. Oh, you know the, the teachers are the teachers are without a contract again. They they want too much money. Right? Teachers are always overpaid. Uh, you know, all all these types of of, of negative aspects are generally or usually associated with education and, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, it, the, the fact is that some of the best things in, in, in the world, some of the best things in the country are happening right now in kindergarten classes and first grade classes. Kids are learning to read, they're breaking through, you know, they're, they're, there's just so much amazing things happening that we need, to, we, we need to reset and celebrate those successes. You can't celebrate your children too much. I was, uh, I was speaking with a, a professor yesterday who we're working with in, a, in another um, initiative and, and you know, he reminded us that you can't spoil babies, right? You can't <laughs> hug a kid too much. You can't love a kid too much. Like, you know, these are things that, these are artificial constructs. You cannot celebrate your children in your classroom and your school and your school district too much. So you need to be looking for ways and, I don't, you know, we need to be looking for ways to sure. celebrate at every turn. And what I'm telling you, whether it's planting a community garden at an elementary school, whether it's helping um, you know, shovel snow at senior citizens' houses in the neighborhood, whether it's a school safety patrol or a bake sale. I mean, these are all things to celebrate. Um, and when children feel good about what they're doing in their schools, they're engaged in school, they're learning, and they're more likely to be successful. I have to say that one of my favorite things um, to do when I'm when I'm on Twitter is I go and I have a list set up of all of educators and superintendents and educators across the state of Michigan and some beyond that and to to really just see the different kinds of things that are going on in schools and they're putting together snow day songs and all kinds <laughs> of other fun things. I mean, it's, it's fun to watch. I really enjoy that. It is absolutely fun to watch. I love to watch them too. I'm going to tell you right now, you will never see me doing the snow day uh, rap or song, <laughs> but, but I, I, I love it. I love watching it. And I, kudos to those folks. Oh, we, we might have to try to convince you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, I, I, I think this, this work is just so important and, and it never stops. It's always a challenge and, and it's, it's always growing, but if you're celebrating and you're, and you're focusing on those positive aspects day in and day out, and I know it's hard, um, believe me, and for folks who are listening, I, I'm, I'm with you, I'm there every day with you. Uh, it, it can be challenging, but at the end of the day, you know, at the, at the end of the sentence, um, you're always leaving off in a better place. And, and I think that it's sort of that commitment to this um, that, that will help drive the, the success forward. Sure. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a question and everybody's going to groan, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> How do you track your outcomes? Right, because everything that's worthwhile has to be measured, right? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. And listen, I, I, I do believe in, in, in assessment. I think assessment is important. Assessment helps spur growth. There's no doubt about it. Um, but at the same time, a word of caution. Don't let a lack of you know, some, some hard data drive you away from what you intuitively know is right for kids, right? So I don't need to show you a longitudinal data set that tells you smiling more in class is gonna be better for your class. Right. You know that. Um, you know that treating your children with kindness and compassion and fostering that type of environment is going to be good for your class. You know that, so do it. Um, I will say though, that there are ways that you can, you can track your outcomes. First and foremost, ask your kids, survey them. Um, get ready. All right, we have to have a little bit of thick skin here because they're going to tell us things that we might thought, you know, oh gosh, we were doing a great job there. Um, and then the kids come back and they say, yeah, no, not so much. Um, that's okay. First of all, you're going to increase your engagement and you're going to increase your, the level of agency that your children are feeling uh, and empowerment just by asking them. But then you become, you know, you start to collect some, some anecdotal feedback, some, some uh, uh, qualitative data that can help inform your practice. There are also quantitative data set points that you can look at if, if you so desire. What are your attendance rates? Are your attendance rates in your school going up or are they going down? Do you have chronically absent kids? Are you looking and focusing um, on what those sort of root causes for those chronic absentees are 
And are you approaching them and using these types of techniques to support those students to increase um, you, you know, their, their school attendance? What about your disciplinary rates? Take a look at discipline. And, and by the way, it doesn't just have to be out of school suspensions, which we know are you know, really harmful, um, but sometimes necessary. Uh, but, but it could also be who gets sent to the office? Um, you know, who gets uh, detention most often? What do those children look like? Are there commonalities? Are there trends? How are we attending to those trends? How are we supporting those kids? Do we believe in second chances? You know, all of these different types of things um, can help to form a more qualitative data, data set as well. What, and, and by the way, so what are your grades, right? What are the outcomes? Um, I always joked around, like, you know, I, I, thought, I thought of myself as a pretty challenging teacher, right? Um, but I always joked around that if I had kids failing my class, I wasn't teaching. Right. Right? So let's just think about that for a minute. If, if I give a test on, you know, on, on assessment day, whatever it is, and 50% of my students don't pass it, okay, maybe 50% of the class didn't study hard enough, but at the same time, it's got to, I've got to start asking myself some questions about my, you know, my, my teaching and, and my engagement practices. So those types of data sets are there. And, and by the way, you can, you can start tracking your outcomes at the classroom level. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a big district-wide initiative. You can engage in these types of, of practices and start looking at those uh, quantitative data sets and qualitative data sets right in your own class, do your own little action research. So yes, you can track the outcomes. <laughs> You know, I know there are some there are some programs out there too that um, really help children identify how they're feeling at the beginning of a, a class session, and in, it helps inform the teacher of where that that student is. And I think if if you were to implement this over a long period of time, that that would be something that you could track as well. Is yeah. you know where are students coming in. It, does it get better when they walk in the classroom? Right. I know, you know, many years ago, um, I, I had a student who every day she came in and she had a long face and I would say hello to her and try to be positive and sunny. And I never outwardly saw anything, but at the, at the end of our class um, semester, she wrote me a note and told me how much of a difference that made. And I don't say that to be um, you know, yeah, so, sure, yeah, sure. you know, but, but I know that her grades continually went up throughout the semester. And so it can be just being in that positive environment that makes such a huge difference with kids. Oh, it does. And, and, you know, you're, you're absolutely right to call out, um, you know, that, that type of a situation. I bet many of the teachers who are listening right now are experiencing those and have experiencing those. I think it, it, it's really important to remember that sometimes we, we can forget that just the, the kind word or the question uh, you know, gen, with genuine care uh, to, to a child can really make all the difference. And you know what? And sometimes it, there, there, there are times where there's a lot happening in, in a child's life and um, it's a lot of bad, right? Absolutely. And yeah, and we have to remember that you know, as, as teachers. Look, again, social studies teacher, right? Uh, at the outset, when I got into the classroom, I wasn't thinking, and I should have been uh, 20 years ago, but I wasn't thinking about these kinds of things. I was thinking about making sure my students were learning the content, right? It was all about the content. And then over time, I recognized the content will come as long as we're attending to the people. And, and when you have somebody that comes into your class and you notice that there's something off, taking that time to attend to that child is very, very important. You could lose that child. Uh, when I say you, I mean we. Yes. You know, and 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 I know, I know. Again, teachers listening right now, they they know this and they do this every day. And, and thank you for that. Um, it can't be overstated how important that is. And that's, I think, that's sort of where the rubber meets the road. And that's where you're really changing lives. I mean, you know, th that's the that's the the type of work. And I know we're looking sort of at a thirty five thousand foot view of social emotional learning right now. I'll give you a really concrete, simple example of what I've seen teachers do in the elementary grades. Is at the beginning of the academic year, sending a note home to parents, guardians, caregivers, and or children. Tell me about your child or tell me about yourself. Sure. And, and you know, parents have the opportunity to sort of pour out what's happening and, and 
wow, what a, what a, if parents take that opportunity or the kid takes that opportunity, what a glimpse into, okay, here I, I get a sense now of this person and how I can help to support that person. Um, powerful stuff and really easy to do. And again, it doesn't cost anything. It is. I've, I've filled out many of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. They're perfect. Um, okay, we are, we're coming up on our hour already, which is kind of surprising to me. I looked up at the clock and said, wow, we better get to questions. So I do <sighs> want to open it up. And if uh, anyone has questions, if you could put those in the chat window, um, we can answer those. I don't have any right now. So I will, I will leave the chat window open and see if there is anyone who um, wants to ask a question. And I will say that I wanted to talk just a little bit about Sweet 360, which is a program that Michigan Virtual makes available to um, those folks who are joining us in Michigan. But this is a digital suite of um, content and it has all kinds of different topics in it um, that are designed to engage and immerse students and parents, including some of the things we've talked about today, bullying, healthy relationships, mental health, all kinds of different um, issues that our youth are dealing with today. Um, oh, sorry about that. There, there are several different um, aspects to that. Okay, is it possible to get a confirmation of it? I don't, I'm not, I don't understand the question, can you ask? We had a question from a participant that I need to clarify before we can answer. So um, we will be sending out some of the information about Sweet 360 also, um, if you are interested in looking at a programmatic approach to implementing SEL in your districts. One of the other things I wanted to mention was um, that Michigan Virtual has developed some courses in conjunction with the Michigan Department of Education. These courses are offered at no cost and include sketch credits for those who want to implement that or who want to take them. You can implement, implement these as a school-wide learning or if you want to have individual people, um, then these are great courses that are available on our website through our professional learning portal. So you can see those here. And the last thing I wanted to mention as far as resources is um, a micro-credential that we developed in conjunction with MEMSPA, uh, which is gives an educator the opportunity to demonstrate their competency in embedding SEL school-wide. Okay, let me get back to our question. Okay, one question that we had was, um, Dr. Ricca, what were the steps you took in implementing a student survey? And did you begin with one building or roll it out district-wide all at once? Great question. Um, I, I particularly believe that when you start with surveys and you haven't done them uh, in the past that you really need to start small. Um, Surveys can be disquieting for some folks because, right, you're not really sure what you're going to get back. Um, so we start small. We start uh, in individual classrooms with teachers who are, who are willing to pilot surveys. Uh, I know some school districts do a top-down sort of uh, approach where everyone's going to get surveyed at once. I believe that um, it's important uh, for the purposes of um, really engaging and, and building consensus um, with beginning with folks who are comfortable and then moving from there. Um, that said, you're still going to get a feedback that is not negative, right? It's, it's critical in the sense of it's helping you to learn about practices that you can, uh, you can attend to. So um, we started out in, in pilots and we moved on from there. Uh, and, and we're still, you know, we're, we're still sort of building on that. And I think we always will be. But, you know, anytime you roll something like that out, it's, it's a process of kind of trial and error and figuring out what um, what data you can get that's actionable and right. valuable. Right, right. And you have to make sure that, you know, and, and sometimes we need help with this, um, construct our, our item construction, the way that we're asking questions um, in order to elicit uh, the clearest answer 
is really important too. So what I recommend is if folks are interested in surveying related to social emotional learning or student engagement, there are some great ones that are already uh, researched that have been researched and used in research studies that, that may be available for uh, replication and use. Um, I would look at those first to get a sense, but hey, you know what? There, as a classroom teacher, if you're interested in, in surveying your, your students in, in a really sort of um, organic way, go ahead and do it. I, I found that that was really uh, great for me. I, by, you know, by the way, when it was report card time when I was teaching, um, I used to allow the kids to, to hand in anonymous report cards for my teaching, um, and I definitely got some, uh, some interesting marks. <laughs> I've done that as well as you have to have thick skin. <laughs> Um, another question that we had from a participant is what type of PD or certification process for facilitating SEL curriculum um, did you have for your teachers? Did you roll out with your teachers? Sure. Um, so, uh, great question as well. So, so first of all, I think that, um, you know, I don't necessarily require there to be sort of a, a micro certificate to be able to uh, turnkey um, best practices in social emotional learning or, or any other type of instructional uh, practice. What we do is, is we try and take advantage of um, faculty and staff members who have uh, really amazing talents and put them in front of other faculty and staff members who are hungry to learn from them. So our district prides itself on, on providing teachers with professional development opportunities wherever possible, whether it's in-house uh, or whether we, you know, they, they go out to, to learning um, that, that's taking place outside of the district, but anything and everything. So anything from, you know, and this is a, a, a actual program, uh, I'm naming it, I'm not necessarily, you know, saying you need to do this, but sure. like a res responsive classroom type of a program, right? Or a, um, a, 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 a therapeutic intervention type of a program or a trauma-informed, uh, you know, classroom. Uh, experience. Those types of experience just in, in, past, you know, in, in the recent past have been high quality for our, our teachers. I know that some of the superintendents that I've spoken to and, and building principals have also um, ruled out book studies that they've done with their staff. Sure. And um, you know there are some that are even being done where they read a chapter or read a certain you know passage and then have Twitter chats about it and yep. they will you know track it by hashtag and yep. then other people can be brought into it there are a lot of innovative ways to do that yeah we're um, actually we, we do that here we're uh, right now with our our cabinet we're actually reading um, school talk by uh, Micah Pollock uh, laying the foundation for equity and rethinking uh, what we say about students every day so how how, how do we talk about our kids right um, what words do we use to describe children? And do we recognize the power behind those words? You know, like if, if, if I said Joe Ricca, wow, he's a handful. And, and I talk about <laughs> Joe Ricca as a handful to the next teacher, and the next teacher, and the next teacher. Does that have a negative self-fulfilling sort of effect on Joe? Maybe. It's kind of funny because every report card I ever got in my life had the comment, talks too much in class. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think and look, about it now and look what I'm doing. I mean, it's like yeah, an and, <laughs> right. And really probably what that should have said is, you know, is, um, is really engaged socially. I mean, again, <laughs> right. You know, can we reframe, can we reframe the way we talk about kids? <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> we are at the end of our time. It is 959. Um, I have to thank you so much for joining us today, all of the participants, and especially Dr. Ricca, the time that you put into preparing for this and the time spending with us for this incredibly important topic. Um, I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks to Michigan Virtual, and, and thanks so much for the folks who, who signed on today. Listen, you know, I believe in the educational community. We need to support each other. If I can ever be supportive to anybody, you can find me at Dr. Joseph Ricca on Twitter. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to, uh, to collaborate and support in any way that I can. Keep doing awesome. the good work. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. It went well. Now what do I have to do? I don't want to end it.